Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the KDPG Sunday edition. I'm Ken Rice. Some call it the best team in NFL history, and that says a lot when you think of the Green Bay Packers of the 60s, the 49ers in the 80s, the Dallas Cowboys in the 90s. But we're talking about a team close to our heart and a special time in our city's history, the Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1970s. Some members of that dynasty are gone now. Others are feeling the effects of crunching blows on the football field. As the Steelers of today have their challenges, the Steelers of the 70s seem larger than life, maybe more so now than ever before. Gary Pomerantz writes about them in a new book called Their Life's Work, The Brotherhood of the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers, Then and Now, published by Simon & Schuster, like this television station, a part of CBS Corporation. And Gary Pomerantz is our special guest this morning on the KDPG Sunday edition. David Tribben is away this week. John Allison, associate editor of the Post-Gazette, joins us. John, welcome to thank you. you. Gary Pomerantz, welcome to you very much. Uh, thank you for being here, and congratulations on your book. Thank from you what very I've read much. So far, it's very enjoyable, rich with detail. Everyone, I think, who's a Steeler fan of a certain age will recognize that phrase, their life's work, instantly. But for those who may be younger or who don't, what are you talking about? Their life's work. It came up in almost every interview I did with players. Chuck Knoll used to say that. You know, it, it, some of them took it as a threat because oftentimes he would use it when he was about to release a player. He would say, uh, you know, it's time to get on with your, your life's work. He had heard that as a player himself from Paul Brown, who was one of the legends of the NFL. And Brown said that when he cut a player, he gathered with the player and said, if, if I were your father and you were my son, I tell you, it's time to get on with your life's work. So, so it bubbled up in every interview, and some players took it as a cold-hearted threat. You know, their NFL careers were done, or, or at least their time with the Steelers. Others took it more as a call to action. They understood what Noel was saying. Football's a brutal game. And so you're, you're one injury, one play away from being done, even if even you future Hall of Famers. What are you going to do then? And, and so Terry Bradshaw, for instance, started his, his sports casting career while still a player. Um, Andy Russell was, was doing investments, and he's still in the investment business all these years later. John Stallworth, um, exhibit A for how to respond to, to that phrase, their life's work. John Stallworth, while playing for the Steelers, went back and earned his master's degree in business and then went home after his career ended in 1987 and built an information technology firm in the aerospace industry in Alabama, and he later sold it for $69 million, and today is a minority owner of the team. Your life's work is being a newspaper man, but not a Pittsburgh guy. Washington Post uh, for most of your career, and now you, you lecture at Stanford. So not a Pittsburgh guy, but you were introduced to the Steelers of the 70s, actually in the early 80s when you were writing for the Post. Tell, tell us about that encounter. Oh, yeah, it's unforgettable. 1981, summer, I was an impressionable 20-year-old sports writer, an intern, no less, at the Washington Post. I got this dream assignment. Go to La Trobe to St. Vincent College and, and write a story about this dynasty of the 70s, this great empire. Is it finally done? And so I went up there, and all the stars were still there. Uh, Brad, I interviewed Bradshaw and Swan, Stallworth, Chuck Knoll was still there, of course, um, and, and Joe Green, who was very memorable because it, it, as I sat on a bench with Joe, I realized that this man's bicep is wider than my, my thigh. Yeah. And a great interview, really thoughtful. And, and these guys were lit from within. They had swagger. They were historic. They knew it. And, and even a 20-year-old couldn't miss the fact that this team had not only in a, an amazing array of talent, but also personality. So that's really where the, this seed was planted. So that was a really interesting time to get to know some of these guys. John, I'll let you jump in in a minute, but just let me find out. So there was that initial experience back in 1981. All these years later, what motivated you to write about the Steelers in depth? And not just the Steelers of that era, but the Steelers of that era as they are today. Yeah, the football's under the microscope now. We all know that. It, it, it's for its violence. Uh, concussions, brain injuries, front center. And so I thought, you know, if I'm going to take on the game, the game itself for what it gives, but also what it takes from the men who play it, who better than the greatest team ever? The, those guys I, I met 32 years ago in Latrobe. They would be my case study, and my narrative would follow them across the decades, through middle age and beyond to today, and, and they've lived the full measure of the football experience. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, to bring out. I mean, there's a lot about the violence, and, and, and you, as a sports writer, you said at some point you kind of gave up on football. You couldn't get into it, but uh, I really like how the book, you take a dual track, but so where are we today? Um, you know, there's another book out about the uh, violence in the sport, you know. Yeah, you get queasy when you watch football. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, you know, we know now what happens the long term from, from hit after hit after hit, and we saw that with this team, um, with Mike Webster, uh, who was the first player diagnosed with CTE, mm -hmm. chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, you know, the, the league has tried to legislate out of existence those dangerous head-to-head, -head, helmet to helmet hits on the quarterback and, and wide receivers, defensive backs out in the periphery. But when I sat with Joe Green in, in, in his uh, living room in Dallas to, do, to interview him for the book, Joe was saying, you know, they can't do anything about the helmet to helmet hits between the tackles, lineman to lineman, that running back comes through, linebackers moving forward. Sometimes we can't even see it. The camera doesn't catch it because of the mass of humanity that's in that, in that mosh pit. And, and so Joe said, you know, you can't take football out of football. And as John Stallworth would, would say, you know, when I played in Pittsburgh, it was hit or be hit. And the team that hit hardest won. Well, yeah, uh, the players exhibit no regret. Everyone you talk to said, I'd do it again. And that's what we did. To a man. Yeah. To a man. No regrets. They, they, um, this is what made them special. That's what Randy Grossman said. You know, this was our, our great gift. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. what separated us from the faceless crowd. It's what makes a guy like me come back to them mm -hmm. 35 years later and say, tell me what it, not only what it was like, but what it meant. And, and um, every one of them would do it again. And I mean, let's face it, John, we, we all make compromises in our lives. You know, the 60 hour a week uh, executive doesn't see his kid enough. Mm -hmm. and, and the social worker and, and the minister, you know, they could make more money, but they follow their life calling. Uh, these guys as young men were our gladiators. And, and they went into the arena on Sundays and brilliantly lit, and they heard the roar of the crowd, and they in, engaged in a violent craft. You say the Steelers couldn't be replicated today because of like free agency or things in the, but is it, I mean, big point of your book is the brotherhood and how it felt, and you know, I, I was alive in the 70s as a teenager here. It was awesome. <laughs> Even if you weren't a football fan, you were suffused with their, their spirit, and, and uh, I mean, have we lost that a little bit in football, that kind of that personality, ac accessibility, you know, when you watch football today? Well, certainly the players in the NFL today will never know this kind of closeness yeah. because of free agency. The great gift now is they can uh, be like grasshoppers and go from team to team and for bigger contracts, and we all get that. But the Steelers of the 70s were teammates for 10 years and more. There's an amazing stat where you take eight of these guys, uh, Terry Bradshaw, Donnie Schell, Swan, and Stallworth, Elsie Greenwood, Joe Green, Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, eight players, all very good players, played 100 seasons in the NFL, a century's worth, every one of them as, as a Pittsburgh Steeler. That's amazing. So that means they knew each other intuitively. They, they knew the women they loved and the, the, the cigarettes they smoked, the beer they drank, and on the field, it translated into um, a complete understanding. We, we know what you're going to do. You know what I'm going to do. We've done it together. You know, they saw each other bloodied, and they saw each other exultant more often than not, you know, winning four Super Bowls in six years. Yeah, here, here's one of the many interesting things uh, that this book points out. As well as the players knew each other, the way they got to know each other, um, many of them told you, if not all of them, that they never really got to know their coach. And let's look at some, some images as we, as we talk about some of the characters that, that you interviewed. Chuck Knoll, even after all the years, after all the battles, uh, the victories and the defeats, he still was relatively unknown to his team. Well, he's uh, deeply respected, certainly. I mean, every player would tell you that this team was created in his image. He had an idea that he wanted to go for players who maybe weren't, you know, the perfect models, you know, built a certain way and highly regarded by every scout. He'd say, let's get somebody who, who projects. Let's take Elsie uh, Greenwood, who's a little undersized. We'll get him on weights and, and we'll make him ours. It was a re-engineering of talent. But to your point, players today would tell you, you know, they never really got close to him then or since those days. Um, Chuck Knoll was, you know, kept a himself at a remove from his players. And I think he worked harder on trying to make sure the players were close. And that worked. Uh, but maybe part of the cost of his approach, his management style, was, you know, there's, they're not that close with him all these years later. But, but the respect is, is deep. On the other hand, uh, the chief, Art Rooney. And you write about his very close relationship with Terry Bradshaw. And the players had a much different feeling about Art Rooney. They loved the man. 
I mean, they loved him. They would, Frenchie Fuqua would tell me stories about how after games, the, the chief would come into the locker room, put his hand on his shoulder, shake his hand, and said, Frenchie, you reminded me of Johnny Blood with that move out there. And, and Fuqua was like, this is, this is being touched by God, you know? And he was like everyone's favorite Irish uncle. Remember, Dan was running the team then, the chief's son, Dan Rooney. And so Dan was the one engaging in the, in the tough contracts. The chief didn't have to deal with that. You know, it's like the grandparent role versus the parent role. You know, the grandparent comes in and gives her the hugs and then says, all right, now you, you handle everything else, parent. The chief was an amazing character, maybe the greatest of all the characters on this team. So the chief was there when the Steelers became the Steelers the, that we think of the successful Steelers. That started with the chief, it started with Dan Rooney, it started with Chuck Knoll and a guy named Joe Green. Mean Joe Green, uh, he was the foundational piece here. It's, it's interesting to think back, you know, that, that Chuck Knoll and Joe Green arrived here uh, 48 hours apart. Knoll's first, you know, order of duty here after becoming head coach was the draft. And so he, was, he went with a defensive tackle from North Texas State, mean Joe Green. Um, he was voted the 13th best player in NFL history. Joe Green doesn't like being 13th best at anything. I wasn't happy he's, about that. He looks like he's winning this race, so that's yeah. another example right there. But the thing about this picture, it's a great picture. You see, you know, with Ernie Holmes closest to us, Dwight White in the middle, and Joe, uh, Joe, the strain on his face. Joe wasn't the fastest. He wasn't the strongest. But he had this, this compensatory quality here, rage, rage. He played the game with rage. Rage, I'm not sure even he understood. Uh, but he, he also was the guy who was the sheriff of the county. He kept that locker room in order, and the coaches loved it because they didn't have to deal with this. Just tell Joe, and Joe will take care of it. All right, let's tell on that note, let's take a break. Uh, lots more to talk about with Gary Pomerantz, author of a great new book on the Steelers of the 70s then and now. We'll continue on the KDPG Sunday Edition. In just Welcome back to the KDPG Sunday Edition. We're talking about the Steelers with the author of a great new book about the Steelers of the 1970s. Gary Pomerantz is the author of Their Life's Work, The Brotherhood of the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers Then and Now, available, uh, I assume, online, Amazon.com, as well as your local bookstores. I know I saw it at uh, Barnes & Noble. So uh, it's out there. And and it's filled with great stories about these guys. As it says, then and now. I want to go back to the then. Uh, we're talking about the foundation of the Steelers. Bill Green, uh, Joe Green, um, uh, Chuck Knoll, another guy, Bill Nunn. And we have a, we have a, a photo to show you of Bill Nunn. Now, uh, his name, not quite as big as those others I just mentioned, but his influence equal, if not more. Yeah, he's one of the great unsung heroes of the dynasty. Bill Nunn was a, was a newspaper man. Uh, he was the man from the Courier. You know, he covered uh, the black colleges for, for decades. And each year he would produce uh, an all-star team of the black colleges. And some NFL teams uh, monitored them very closely because the, there were some great players there. Um, and Dan Rooney finally brought Bill into the fold uh, in, in the late 60s. And, and when, in so doing, brought all of Bill's contacts with those coaches at the historically black colleges with him. And so in the years that followed, Bills and, and, and the team started to select these, uh, these great players. If you take Bill Nunn away from the 1970 Steelers, it would have like a, a Swiss cheese effect. Who were a couple of the... the yeah, gone would be uh, Mel Blunt. Gone would be Elsie Greenwood. Uh, gone would be Donnie Schell and, and Ernie Holmes and Joe Gillum. This is not to say, as Bill would tell you, that all his picks worked because they didn't. But, but his impact on this team was huge. Yeah, the ones that didn't work out, those have been forgotten. They've People been forgotten. Focus on the ones. Not by Bill, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the fact that, um, that having a man with those kind of connections to the African-American community, how important that was, uh, it reminds you of a time in our nation's history that we're not proud of and the racism that so many of these players uh, just had to deal with as a matter of course. And Joe Gillum, uh, you know, when he was starting games, the hate mail, that he received simply because he was a black man playing quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right, and, and people sometimes don't remember that that first Super Bowl season, the first six games of that year, Joe Gillum was the quarterback, not Terry Bradshaw. He, he had beat out uh, Hanratty and Bradshaw in training camp, and the position was his. The same year, 1974, Henry Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record, and he received all kinds of, of hate mail. Right. And uh, so too with, with Joey Gillum. I mean, he kept a cardboard box about three feet tall, according to his father. Uh, I interviewed his father about it and, and um, filled to the brim with, with hate mail. Some of his teammates talked about it. Mike Wagner told me a story 
where he, he was sitting next to uh, Joe Gillum in the locker room. And Gillum said, uh, look at this. And he hands him a letter. He was opening some of his mail. And as Mike Wagner described it, it was just filled with venom, you know, racist hate. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Wagner looked at him and said, you get a lot of this, Joe? And Gillum said, yeah. Nothing more, just yeah. And it, so, you know, you think about the pressures that he was facing, let alone the Oakland Raider pass rush. He's right. got to deal with that. His parents were legitimately concerned for his safety. They were. They were. He had death threats. And uh, his father, Coach Joe Gillum, senior from Tennessee State, uh, went to the Steelers to discuss it. They were concerned. His wife, Ruth Gillum, wanted to bring Joey home. Don't stay here. And she had concerns that he wasn't mature enough to handle the money and the success and the bright lights. Hard to make a connection with his terrible drug habits were his, his downfall. And you're pretty clear about that in the book. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. He threw the ball sweetly. Yeah. This, this guy could play. Uh, but after the Raiders had hit him hard in the third game of that season, a 17 nothing loss for, for the Steelers, um, Gillum's brother told me that Gillum went out, was at a party, and was introduced to, to heroin. And that started the cycle that would last throughout his life, a cycle of drug addiction. He died at the age of 49 from a cocaine overdose. Through all of the interviews that you did, all the research that you did, you learned so much about these personalities, how their characters came together and became a championship team, but you also learned about the city of Pittsburgh then and now. What are some of the insights you gained into our town? Well, I love this town. What, what amazes me about this Pittsburgh... This town loves you now. Well, <laughs> what amazes me about this town is how everyone is so devoted to it. You know, and you take it for granted, as I think this town tends to take the 70s Steelers for granted, uh, but it's not that way in every place, uh, you know, and um, that scene from coming through the Fort Pitt Tunnel, I mean, it's one of my favorite. I put it up there. I get to see the Golden Gate Bridge every day, uh, but there's the New York skyline, the Golden Gate Bridge, and that scene coming out of the Fort Pitt Tunnel, it's, it's an extraordinary sensory overload. The city in the 70s, you know, was in trouble. Steel was dying, we all know that. Uh, but this is where the Steelers came in and played a part. They were the emotional life raft for, for Western Pennsylvania. And in 79, so too with the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? 100 days apart, you win, the city wins a World Series and, and a Super Bowl, and suddenly um, it's the city of champions. We have a photo I want to show. It's, uh, it's number six in our file. It's from the 40th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception, uh, which was uh, 1972. Now you talk to, I think, everybody involved in that play. And uh, did you solve any mysteries? Did anybody fess up to anything? Well, uh, all I can tell you is I visited Frenchy Fuqua in his man cave <laughs> in Detroit, no. and, mm -hmm. and that man is still talking about the Immaculate Reception. <laughs> you would think he scored the touchdown, or at least through the pass. All he did is just get annihilated by the safety, Jack mm -hmm. Tatum. Yeah. And he tells that story, um, and he tells it quite well, a little different twist each time, but it always ends the same way, where he, he's about to tell you what really happened, <laughs> And then he said, oh, all I can tell you is it was truly immaculate. <laughs> and that's as far as he'll, that's he'll, as far he'll, as he'll, he's take, he'll take that to his grave. Uh, you see the wardrobe here. That was a big deal with these guys, too. And Myron Cope uh, was part of stoking this sort of uh, fashion competition. Yeah, that's the Frenchman. You know, he told the story that he was uh, royalty in France and that he, he uh, was sunning one day on the French Riviera and fell asleep and woke up and realized he turned black. <laughs> and he said he lived his life as Negro royalty. Well, he also uh, had great flair with his, with his outfits. And, and you, you saw it there that he's in his cape and his musketeer hats. And, you know, we, we laugh about it, but what, what we need to realize is that too played a role in this team. You know, this is, this is a, a very, uh, it's like being in a, uh, a pressure chamber. And, and guys like Frenchy Fuqua lighten that load a little bit, ease the pressure. I appreciate the detail that his goldfish uh, shoes were too tight for him. He got them, <laughs> someone mailed them to him and they said, oh, uh, I gave him 10 and a half, but he really wore 11. So he had to suffer pain even when he wore those out in public, right? He, yeah, he, These are all the for the good of the team. The heels, right. <laughs> all for the good of the team. Uh, mem uh, uh, interviews that, uh, that truly stand out in terms of being memorable, in terms of being surprising in the process of putting this book together. Well, a couple of the interviews with Joe Green. Uh, I remember sitting with him and we were talking about the passing of Dwight White, who died back in 2008. And Joe and, and Dwight were very close. And he was remembering getting that call from Pittsburgh, from Franco Harris, Franco saying, he's gone. And, and Joe was staring off in the distance. 
inhabiting that moment when he received the phone call again and, and just saying, he's gone. And, and it was like he was living it again and the tears came. Um, also, a very different Joe Green interview, sitting with him, uh, reviewing some game films I brought, DVDs of Super Bowl IX. And there's one moment uh, where the Steelers uh, go ahead and take control of this game in, late in the game. And Joe's sitting on his couch watching this, and he starts chanting, here we go, Steelers, here we go. And, and he was young again. I mean, frankly, it was, it was beautiful to see. Uh, John Stallworth also stands out. He's very impressive on many levels, but in particular with his introspection. He talked about, uh, you know, having this dream almost of, of wanting to, to bring the, all the guys back. And there's a picture of John Stallworth, 82, sitting with, with Lynn Swan in their rookie years. Uh, but John wanted to bring everybody back one more time, and he wanted to do it in this special place, which was the sauna at Three Rivers Stadium. Post-game, the guys would go in there. There was beer in there. They'd have a beer. They'd talk about the game. Lambert was sort of holding court. And, you know, they were wearing towels around their waist, whatever. The, the, uh, the, the steam was not turned on. And they'd talk about the game, and that's where the brotherhood that Esprit de Corps w was developed. Um, you know, they, they, they knew they were a special team. And they laughed, and, and so Stallworth said, if we could get everybody together again, and he starts mentioning names even of players who have passed, Ernie Holmes and Dwight White and Bradshaw, and he starts listing all these names. And he said, what I'd like to do is we talk about what we've been doing, how everybody is since we were last together. And he would ask the question, you know, what makes you happy? What makes you sad? And he, and he came to the point that, you know, it's not only now for these Steelers about remembering and celebrating the times they shared back, way back when, but also what, you know, the years they so have left. Sort of a poignant counterpoint to that, are there, uh, the wives of uh, Mike Webster and uh, Steve Furness, there, there's a point in the book where they're, they're cut from the team and, and they, they feel, suddenly the wives feel isolated. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, but there was a moment where they just suddenly, oh, my life is this football team, and then, boink, it was gone. It was yeah. Yeah, the wives have great stories to tell. Sometimes better stories than the husbands because, you know, women oftentimes are willing to go more on an emotional, across the emotional spectrum in interviews where these alpha males are going to only go so far in, in heading towards the truth. And uh, both Debbie Furness and, and Pam Webster were, were wonderful interviews and, and really deep in the, the book. You just have about a minute left. Uh, as interesting as it is to talk about everyone who you interviewed, and it seems to me you interviewed all of the key players with a couple of exceptions. Uh, Chuck Knoll, who we understand it, it has not been well for, uh, for several years now, uh, and Jack Lambert. What's happened to Jack Lambert? Jack Lambert, you know, he's, he's sort of the J.D. Salinger of this team, right? And everybody said, did you get Lambert? Did you get Lambert? Well, no, I didn't speak with Lambert. I had his phone number and I called him message phone, you know, beeps, hi, this is Jack, leave a message. And I said, Jack, my name's Gary Pomerantz, I'm a writer from California, and, and it was like, beep, I was cut off. <laughs> I'm thinking it's about eight or ten seconds. I say, okay, Lambert, I'm, I'm ready to go now. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to do this, and I dial a number again. Hi, this is Jack, leave a message, beep. I said, hi, Jack, this is Gary Pomerantz, I'm from San Francisco, I need to talk to you, here's my number. And uh, needless to say, I didn't get a call you, back. You're still waiting. You're probably a little afraid to knock on his door, <laughs> too. No, I, I have great admiration and respect for Jack Lambert. Uh, and I can tell you, every one of those guys was really happy on Sunday that he was a Steeler. Mm -hmm. Gary Pomerantz, thank you very much. The book, once again, is called Their Life's Work, The Brotherhood of the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers, Then and Now, for sale now at your favorite bookstore or online. Pleasure to meet you today. Congratulations on the book. We'll be back with some final thoughts in just a moment.